Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today we are joined by Jeremy Fortune, Client Success Manager at Phoenix Data Systems. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Phoenix Data Systems. Phoenix is committed to offering the finest CMS software, service and support available in the industry. Their AIMS 3 software is powerful yet flexible to improve operational efficiency and has evolved by listening to and collaborating with their customers. Their annual AIMS Use Account Conference is one of the primary ways they achieve this exchange of ideas. Phoenix is dedicated to the continued development of their AIMS 3 platform. For more information, please visit goaims.com. Just a reminder that TechNation is headed to our spring MD Expo at the Woodlands Waterway Marriott Hotel and Convention Center in Houston, Texas, April the 11th to the 13th. Please join us for three days of education, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology products and services. Registration is open, so for more details, please visit mdexposhow.com. Also, uh, please mark your calendars for our HTM Mixer, which is being held at the Turf Valley Resort in Baltimore, Maryland, from May the 11th to the 12th. Our Mixer is a, a slightly modified, smaller, shorter duration and less crowded event that still provides valuable continuing education, networking and vendor engagement opportunities. For more information and registration details, please visit htmmixer.com. And also, I just want to quick, a quick make, mention uh, that Tech Nation has a new contest, What's on Your Bench, where it features a photo of a biomeds bench with a list of five or, things, five or six things on your bench. Uh, send a photo of your bench with the list of the items to jwallace at mdpublishing.com, and when the photo is used, an Amazon gift card will be sent to you. Okay, today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our Webinar Wednesday t-shirts to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. Phoenix Data, our sponsor today, is headquartered in Michigan, and Michigan State is playing in March Madness. So what is the team known as? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard, and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A, so please submit your questions anytime using the questions feature on the dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Jeremy Fortune, and he will be discussing how the right CMS can pay for itself within two years. Jeremy, you may begin whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Jeremy Fortune. Like I said, like Linda just said, I am the Client Success Manager at Phoenix Data Systems. Although our corporate office is based up in Michigan, I am blessed to be based in Florida where it's a lot warmer. So for all you folks that are down south, I hope you're enjoying the warm weather like I am. All right. So today's webinar, uh, interested in a CMMS that is so efficient it can pay for itself within two years. So we're going to be talking about some of the ways that AIMS 3 can possibly save you some money. Uh, We base that all on an ROI, your return on investment. It's generally defined as the ratio of net profit over the total cost of the investment. The return is the profit you make as a result of your investments. The ROI metric can be applied to an investment in CMMS software based on the amount of money an organization can save from the improvements made in their workflows and processes. So essentially, what AIMS 3 was designed to do is not designed necessarily to save you dollars. It's more designed to save folks time. So what does that entail? So I've got a couple calculations up here. I'm going to go through a, a scenario before we really dump, jump into the software, and I can show you some tidbits on exactly what AIMS 3 was, was designed to do and show you some ways around saving time. Okay. Um, we made some high level presumptions in regards to just a medium sized hospital here, as you can see. So, you know, we have some large hospitals that have 60 to 100 techs that are spread out. 
And then we have some small hospitals that may have one or two techs. It really depends. We are in 3,000 plus hospitals in 22 different countries, and we service the smallest of the small to the largest of the large. So if you've got, you know, we just kind of, for this scenario, what I'm doing is I'm using a hospital with seven technicians that average about an $80 an hour total cost. Now that's not salary, that's salary, including what it takes to have a technician work in the hospital. My directors and folks that are of the financial, uh, know, know their financials and their departments know what I'm talking about. Um, let's just throw in that each tech has three, three weeks of vacation a year, and the depart, you know, an average department, the techs will do five work orders a day. This is again, this is all high level, but this is just a scenario that where maybe if you know the numbers within your specific organization, you can plug them in and use the exact same formula that I'm saying where I'm showing you right here. Essentially, what we have tried to do when we design AIMS 3 is if you can save just two minutes per work order, um, that time adds up to a lot of productivity which entails gonna save you a lot of money. In this scenario, we were able to actually save almost a department in a year, almost $160,000. Now you're gonna see the, uh, the formula there in the middle. Um, you Basically what you'll do is your number of techs, you'll multiply that by their average wage. Again, wages can vary. $80 is just kind of a median number. Again, I've got some hospitals that are 110 an hour, then I've got some hospitals that are 35 an hour. So. Those of you, like I said, that know your numbers within your hospital, go ahead and plug that in. You know the average number of work orders that your department usually churns out. It could be a combination of corrective or preventive maintenance work orders. Really, really is depending on your workflows. So what I've done is I've multiplied the text and the average wage times the average number of work orders that are closed within a week. Um, and then I, I add in that two minutes per work order savings, okay? And then you'll plug in your 49 weeks uh, plus the number of days the text work, okay? So down there at the bottom, you're gonna see the numbers and that's exactly how I came up with the, the $160,000. And again, at the bottom of the slide, you're gonna see the ability to actually plug in your own. Now, when talking about calculating your CMMS costs, very important to include all the costs of the life of the software, okay? Give me one second. Now what that means is we've used it a host we've used a hosted model to kind of do this okay so again every quote is different so when I quote a specific hospital they all have their specific needs but like I said I'm just kind of doing a, a real high 30,000 foot uh, average of what you may see so average software yearly rental 110,000 conversion costs implementation costs these are all one time costs depending on how much training how much what you're your typical support is going to be, what your hosting fee is going to be, and so forth. So you have all the numbers down there. And let's just say at the bottom, your initial cost of your of, of the CMMS that you decide that you want to be a part of is right around $211,000, okay? Now, again, taking it to uh, your first year costs are obviously going to be higher um, because you've got all those one-time uh, costs as far as the data conversion goes, like I said, the training, the employee onboarding costs. It also will reflect if you want to do a service as a software solution. So a SaaS model typically is going to decrease your overall yearly, uh, your overall implementation costs, but your ongoing yearly costs are going to increase. All right. The industry, the industry trend, and like I said, we're very in tune to what um, what goes on with throughout the industry. We have a lot of folks that have a lot of experience um, in regards to the CMMS uh, engineering platform and how to convert different databases. It really just depends on the specific CMMS that you're using. We also have a lot of experience on the biomet. We have several years of experience, whether you're a director or technician on the um, Phoenix data front. So we're able to kind of study the trends. And again, that's another reason why we were able to develop AIMS 3 the way that we did. Now, like I said, the industry trend is moving towards a hosted solution uh, more and more. Folks just don't want to have the, they don't want to have to deal with all the headaches that may come with having and ho uh, hosting their own CMMS. Some IT uh, departments have a lot of uh, controls there, you know, so they, more folks want more control. And again, they want that the CMMS, the company to actually take care of the database for them so they don't have to worry about certain things. 
Um, you also got to make uh, assumptions when you're talking about, you know, calculating your costs is, is it going to be full service? What kind of data conversion? What kind of implementation? Are you going to have any in, uh, interfaces? What kind of support are you looking to do? What kind of support does the CMMS platform that you're looking at, how do they break down their support? Do they do it by license, a license uh, model? We do it by concurrent license. So let's say you have 30 technicians on your, your staff. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to buy 30 licenses because we're looking at how many folks do you do you project are going to be logged into the database at the same time. Okay. Now some folks are going to buy 30 licenses, which is perfectly fine. But just want though you're going to know like the hours of operation that your specific um, your specific hospital uses and so forth. So I take into account all of these. So let's just say high level. The initial savings when we did that initial ROI, ROI calculation would save you about $160,000. Your first year cost, as you can see, is going to be about $211,000, $212,000. Now, calculating your payback for the ROI, like I just mentioned, $150,000, $160,000 annual savings just by churning, just by cutting two minutes off of a work order. Your first year cost when you buy a new CMS including everything from the implementation to the training to the support one-time cost is going to be about two hundred eleven thousand. so right now you're at about forty three thousand as far as your annual cost go think about after year two year two cutting off two minutes per work order you would have saved upwards of almost three hundred twenty thousand dollars so you're you would have a return investment of about 25 percent and you can see the calculation right there okay that's kind of a big deal. Like I said, in, in, in less dollars, more AIM3 saves folks time. And I'm gonna show you a lot of the ways that it's gonna save time. But just think about your hospital saves about 13,000 per month and has ongoing costs of 3,500. You're gonna pay for that new CMS within 22 months. All right. So why AIM3? Why is that the right one? Well, AIM3 has been around for 40 years. That means we have staying power, we're not a flash in the pan. Like I mentioned earlier, um, 3,000 plus hospitals in 22 different countries. Um, we have the smallest of the small. We also have large hospitals as well that we are, uh, that have already been clients of ours for many years and we are in the, in the process of implementing as well. It's designed to improve the efficiency within the HTM as well as facility departments. We're not just a clinical engineering software, although that is we cater to the most, but we have a lot of facilities groups coming on board, IT groups, um, EVS, culinary, you name it. If there's a department in the hospital, we can facilitate it. Highly customable, customizable UI. User interface is very customizable, which I'm gonna show you here shortly. We have an automation feature, which is going to save time, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. The way that we do PM scheduling. I've been around a lot of other CMSs in the past. I worked for a large uh, company for more than a decade as a project manager and a consultant. And I'll tell you that the scheduling, the way that we do scheduling within uh, AIMS 3 is bar none, some of the best that I've seen. And then we have an EasyNet platform, which is essentially your, your end user uh, portal to where he or she will be able to submit requests, which is kind of a typical thing that all CMSs are going to have. Um, but we wanted to show you, show you some of the highlights of why we are what we are. So give me one second. I am going to go ahead and switch screens to where I can show you a little bit about um, AIMS 3. So this is the front end of AIMS 3. Before I jump into AIMS 3 and show you some of the ways that it can save time, again, getting your return on investment, which is what we're talking about today. AIMS 3 is browser agnostic, meaning that you can use it on any browser. I'm using it on Chrome right now, but if you like, uh, if you're relegated to Internet Explorer, which recently lost, we lost support on, um, they're converting a lot of folks over to the Edge platform. A lot of uh, other CMSs out there are using plugins and extensions. We got ahead of that. We wanted to make sure that the software again was very flexible enough to be on any platform desired 
The other part of this is it's also uh, device agnostic, meaning you can use this on any device as well. Instead of if you've got a strong network within your hospital, there's really no need to buy any kind of mobile licenses because you can actually scale this down and you can use it on whether on an iOS device as well as an Android device. So there's two ways of saving time right then and there. Like I mentioned in the in the slideshow, you have the ability to customize this as well. So the designer of Ames 3, the, our product uh, manager, he always likes to say that we design this in a way to keep your technicians out of the software as much as possible. Therefore, they are out doing what they're paid to do, which is fix equipment, PM equipment, not sitting in front of their computer screen, opening and closing work orders, sifting through data, looking for this, looking for that. And that, that has been a, an industry issue for a very long time. Your technicians having to sit in front of a screen and go on wild goose chases, okay? So what we wanted to do is within one click of entering the software, we wanted your technicians to be able to see everything that he or she should be seeing so they can get right to work and start knocking out what they're paid to do, okay? So like I said, this is highly customizable. This can be uh, set up any way that you desire. We have a lot of different other uh, pieces of functionality that you can add to the front end of this, but I'm just gonna pick a couple of them that I know can save time. So this is a demo database, and I have uh, essentially set this up. It, it really doesn't matter how many hospitals you have or what your hierarchy looks like within your specific organization, whether you have a bunch of medical office buildings or you're responsible for a lot of clinics, or you just got one main hospital. Ames 3 has the ability to actually sift through and, de and decide and, and break the hierarchy down however you want it to be broken down. And what does that mean? If I've got a technician, let's say I've got two or three hospitals within my organization, but I have technician A that is only going to be in the Northwest Hospital, I don't want him or her having to sift through a whole bunch of assets, work orders, PMs, whatever it is, and other hospitals that they don't have anything to do with. Again, that is them wasting time sitting in front of their screen, okay? Every second of the day is either gonna to contribute to product, a positive productivity or it's gonna negate it. That's just bottom line, okay? So what we've done is we've been able to, to segment however you need, whatever your organization, however it's set up, we're gonna be able to facilitate that. Now, I have, logged in as a manager where I oversee multiple people. Now, if I'm a technician and I log in, let's just say I'm gonna log in, as soon as I log in, all I'm going to see are the work orders that are assigned to me. Again, I'm not seeing these long lists of things where I have to query, I have to filter, I have to do this, I have to do that. As Soon as I log in, one click, my dashboard, one click, I'm jiving into a work order. That's the way that we have designed this. We really wanted to, to, to keep your text, unless they have to be over here in the menu section, they can just stay right here. I've also set up something in the, our .NET and our Ames 3 users are very familiar with is something called macros. So where they can actually create and save specific queries that are important to them, okay? So let's just say that I'm looking at, I wanna look at all the anesthesia, a, a, uh, anesthesia assets within my inventory because maybe I'm a subject matter expert within the operating room. As Soon as I click on that, I'm gonna be able to see all the assets that are there. I can jump right into those asset records. Again, one click to log into the software, one click to log into assets that I might be responsible for. We can do this and you can set up queries regardless of what they are, whether they're contracts, whether they're parts, whether they're location-based, cost center-based, uh, work order type-based, it could be equipment type, model-based, whatever it is, you have the ability to save whatever macros you want right here on the front end. So again, one click to log into the screen, one click to jump into whatever list you needed to look, whatever you need to. Also have the ability to pretty much export from any portion of the screen as well. So if I just want a real quick list of all the work orders that I'm in charge of, I can click on it, send it right to Excel access, no problem. Then they can, you know, whatever I need to do. If I'm a manager, let's say I'm, I'm in charge of all six of these people, you're going to see as soon as I log in, I'm going to see how many work orders are responsible for, for who's responsible for what. And I got a chart down here that's going to tell me exactly where everybody is in relation to the month for their preventive maintenance work orders. 
Now, there's a lot of other ways to extract this data and this information. I'm just showing you one of the ways that you can do it. So within two seconds, as soon as I log in and I'm a manager and I oversee five other technicians, I'm going to know where he or her is in regards to their preventive maintenance, uh, their, their closeout percentage right now for the month. And I can either adjust fire and see if folks are going to need to pick up the pace or I know the folks are way ahead of the curve. This chart actually resets itself at the beginning of every month. So it doesn't matter if it's February with 28 days or March with 30, 31 days. This dotted line continues to progress to the 100 and it'll reset itself. And again, it only takes into account preventive maintenance percentage, preventive maintenance work orders. And again, as you see, I hover over it, it's gonna give me everybody's percentage right now. Now we can create dashboards that are gonna be way more interactive with this and we can eventually put them on the front end but these are all just default settings that I can set up on my customizable home screen, okay? This is gonna work perfectly for, uh, for like I said, technicians to see only the things that they need to see as well as uh, managers, directors to see exactly what they need to see as well, okay? We got other couple other uh, cool features right here. Uh, the logged in user is gonna have a breadcrumb trail. So let's say I'm technician A and I log out on Friday, I log back on on Monday, I don't remember exactly what I was working on that afternoon because I was excited for the weekend. I got a whole list of the records that I had access. So I can actually jump back into those work orders, those records, asset records, contracts, part records, whatever they may be. And I can finish what I may not have uh, finished uh, the week prior. Okay. We also have another time saving piece is every time we have a new build, or a new bug fix or a new release or whatever it may be, we automatically upload the release notes directly onto the UI, okay? So let's say we have a new build or you know wh whatever it may be, you don't have to contact Phoenix directly unless you want to, but you don't have to contact us directly to get release notes to find out what bug fixes have happened, what enhancements were added to this release. Um, why does the screen look differently? Maybe we didn't test it the way we needed to test it prior to them releasing a new bill. All that information is gonna be right there. Again, one click to log into the application, one click to go onto the release notes. We also have how-to guides, okay? Let's say you're doing the train the trainer, you got a bunch of new technicians that are coming on board, um, and, or you got a one technician coming on board, or, or you, you attended the training, but you forgot how to do a specific task within a work order, within an equipment record. How do I add a part to this again? How do I uh, how do I uh, uh, edit a data manager because I have access to that or whatever it may be? You actually can dive right into these PDFs, save them to your desktop, you can send them to the technicians, they'll upload. And uh, we're constantly evolving these. So we're gonna be eventually adding uh, video snippets and, and smaller uh, documents that are gonna break it down even further, okay? But this is really just, uh, really cool features that are directly added to the UI. Again, saving time. You don't have to contact us. You don't have to go here. You don't have to go there. If you have access to go into the app, actual application, you have login access, you will be able to look at release notes. You will be able to look at login guides and, and user guides and so forth right from the UI. Okay. Now, we have also developed uh, uh, something else that can even seg uh, segue segment the data even better okay let's say for you larger hospitals where you have a sophisticated hierarchy schedule you have a lot of different folks that have different jobs that they only need to see certain things and you're also interested in trying to keep your data clean maybe you've got a lot of response codes maybe you've got a lot of failure codes maybe some of those failure codes which we've seen a lot in the industry again I, i've been around the block so I, i've seen a lot of people's databases to where some of them kind of look duplicate so which one do i choose if I'm in this scenario where I'm fixing this piece of equipment. Well, those of you familiar with data managers, this is pretty much where we house all of your cost center data, all of your equipment types, all of your employee records and so forth. What we've done is we've created something called assignment profiles. And this is gonna be something that's going to save you some time as well, again. So what is an assignment profile? Well. The beauty of it is that you will determine that. You can create as many as you want. So what I've done is I've created a couple scenarios within here that are gonna actually help you save some time. Now, let's say you've got an anesthesia subject matter expert right here, or you've got two or three 
You've got 22 ORs, you've got two or three folks that all they do is OR stuff. They're not dealing with any other cost centers. Their job is the OR. Or I can actually create something like this, decide which service department. Trades probably is not gonna be relevant to this, but I'm only gonna show specific cost centers to them. Meaning that when I log into the database, I'm only going to have access to certain cost centers. Therefore, I'm not sifting through cost centers that I have nothing to deal with. And I'm not sifting through assets that are not that are not pertaining to the cost centers that I'm assigned to. Okay. Again, saving 30 seconds here, saving time there. Let's say I have a whole bunch of procedures built into my database, but I don't need to look at some of these other ones. I can actually choose some of these uh in, in label the procedures that my subject matter expert is going to have access to. Same with equipment type. Okay. Let's say that I only have specific equipment types that I want him, him or her to see. So when I log in, again, I'm only going to look at the data from my assignment profile that's listed. So if I go into this equipment list and I'm assigned to the uh, and I'm uh, I'm assigned to the anesthesia subject matter expert assignment profile, I'm only going to have access to that specific thing. Let's say uh, I have a large hospital that they actually have an infusion pump team. So they've got new technicians straight out of biomed school. They want them to pay their dues, and all they're doing is they're looking at fixing, PMing the thousand infusion pumps they have currently within their database. Okay, so that I believe they had three technicians that it's all they worked on all the time. So they don't need to be sifting through a whole bunch of things like defibrillators, or ESUs or telemetry packs or whatever it may be, they're only going to deal with the cost center because all the infusion pumps are specifically assigned to the central supply uh, cost center within this specific organization. So we've created a something called infusion pump team. The only procedure they need to deal with are the annual infusion pumps. And what they've done is they've segmented the 1,000 or 1,200 infusion pumps that they have throughout the year. So I think they've got like 50 to 60 a month that these three folks, they in it, they're, they're in charge of trying to find, track down, and then PM. Uh, they're going to deal with these equipment type infusion pumps, and they're only going to deal with the specific failure codes and response codes that infusion pumps are uh, associated with. Therefore, getting rid of a bunch of other failure codes that they don't need to have the option to choose from, along with response codes they don't need to have the option to choose from. And again, you're keeping your data clean as well. Okay, I've seen a lot of uh, organizations with a lot of different failure codes, response codes, whatever you want to call it, and a lot of them can be very close or similar. And you've got one technician, they interpret it as this one code, another technician does the same exact job, but they interpret it as that code. Next thing you know, you've got some corrupted data. Okay, so this assignment profile really helps segment the data and keeps your technicians, regardless of what job they have in the hospital, focus on only the things that he or she needs to be looked on. And again, you can create any kind of scenario within here. Sometimes you only have a clinical engineering one. Sometimes clinical, you, uh, you only have it location-based, which we're gonna be adding here very shortly. So if you've got folks that are only in charge of dealing with uh, specific clinics or medical office buildings, they're only doing temp probes, they're only doing a specific, it's very easy to just segment, assign them that within their employee record. So when he or she logs into the database, they're only going to see the things that they need to see. That means saving time. That means keeping your data clean. Okay. During the PowerPoint, I also mentioned something else. We have we have a very powerful tool that we develop and we continue to develop called automation. Okay. Right? So what is automation? So automation is built into here, and it's essentially a rules engine. If anybody recognizes that term. And I've got a couple automation scenarios built into here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at one of them. Okay, one second. Now, essentially what automation does is it's automatically going to update specific fields within your database if a, a, a trigger happens or there's a condition within the database itself. So if there's a, a, a specific um, scenario where certain fields are populated with a certain uh, value, the, the, the automation piece will automatically update other values within there, saving you time and again, keeping your data clean because everybody's going to be on the same page. There's lots of scenarios where if you click on one field, you're supposed to click on another field. 
to populate that. Some technicians may miss it. Some technicians may not know. Therefore, you've got inconsistent data throughout the throughout the uh, throughout the database. So what I've done is I've created a couple scenarios. So here's one called all parts received. So what you do is you come in here, you create the rule name, you decide what the trigger is. So you're going to choose an event, you're going to choose the components that are going to be affected by events by that event, and then you're going to choose the fields that are going to be changed, and then whatever condition in the database is. So this one right here is designed to automatically notify text when all the parts for a particular work order have been received. You can limit it by priority or any other factors as well. So the only triggers for the work orders that you needed to, okay? Again, saving time. One little step that I may have missed is gonna keep your data clean. It's also gonna save you time. It's automatically going to update certain things. Retiring equipment, which everybody on this call, I'm sure can relate to. When do I retire it? What is the scenario where I can retire it? Do I gotta contact my manager to ask permission to do that? Or what? what is the process? And then if I do retire something, what are my status is going to be changed to? What do I need to do here? What do I need to do there? Within automation, you can actually set it up to where it's automatic. Once you change the status on it to a retired, it's automatically going to update other fields in the database. You don't even have to do it. All you got to do is, as soon as you click save in that record, it's automatically going to set it up and, and populate those fields for you. You close work order, although let's say, um, and you notify you can notify assign text that this specific uh, this specific piece of equipment is going away. It'll create a work order with a special procedure to clear all the PHI scrap parts or whatever it is. This is just an example, okay? But this is a this is a rule that you can do within as far as retiring equipment. You also have something here where we can do a PM preventable. So let's say that you're on an AEM or an OEM, okay? So this specific you you're your department has decided that this specific model for this specific equipment type is, is, is uh, eligible to be on an AEM uh, preventive maintenance schedule, okay? Meaning that you don't really need to deal with it. But let's say you constantly are going back and forth trying to fix this piece of equipment when, and you determine that, you know what, if we had this on a annual or semi-annual PM schedule, um, we wouldn't be coming back fixing this. Therefore, we would be saving time. Therefore, we'd be saving money. Therefore, um, we're not, you know, we, this should not be an AEM. Well, within our equipment record or within the, uh, the actual work order of equipment record or equi within the work order, within our update feature, we have something called PM Preventable right here. So if we come in there and we change a field within, within a specific AEM eligible model, it will automatically populate this to PM Preventable, yes. Meaning if this was on a PM Preventable schedule, um, it's automatically going to calculate this as yes when I save this work. Again, saving you time and it, technicians that may be working on this may not know that they have to drop that checkbox because this is not a required field within a work order. And when you're doing an AEM and you're getting joint commission or DMV uh, inspected, this is a big deal to have. Why are you on an AEM? Why, are, why is this specific model on an AEM when it's cost you so-and-so dollars this year? Well, these are these are red flag pieces that you can put within a work order that are going to help you say, okay, maybe we should take this off. Maybe we need to to replace this specific one. Okay. So bottom line is the the automation tool is meant to save you a lot of uh, extra steps, and we're constantly adding new uh, triggers, new conditions, so we can apply this on so many different areas of the actual database itself within the application where you're going to be able to set up rules for all kinds of different scenarios within AIMS 3. Therefore, again, saving you time, saving you money, saving you productivity, okay? So these are just some key uh, factors within AIMS 3. So I want to show you guys a couple other pieces that are, again, time savers. So I'm in an asset record right now. As soon as I log into this asset record, you're going to see these red identifiers up here. Contract is under equipment or under or this equipment is under contract. Equipment's under warranty. This is considered critical. Uh, this is identified as high risk. These are factors that your technician, whoever accessed this, may not know. So they may be, this may be the first time that they encounter this specific asset. So then they're gonna, first thing they need to determine is okay, should I even be working on this? And a lot of other CMSs out there, you have to go through tab by tab by tab to try to find out, should I be working on this? Again, 30 seconds to find out if it's under contract, 
you're, you're saving time. As soon as, this, as soon as I access this equipment record, I've got this identifier right here where I can click on it and it's gonna tell me all the details of this, con of this asset. Should I even be working on this? Letting your technicians know right off the bat that they don't need to be working on it or it's only covered this specific labor or parts included or where I should, uh, where I should uh, who should I contact for this? Everything is right here. And uh, if I have access, um, I can actually jump right into that contract right from here to see the details of it. Again, I wouldn't recommend allowing everybody to have access to contract to be able to edit things, but that's what you're going to see. So as soon as I log in, if something's under contract, if something's under warranty, it's letting the technician know right there. If something is high risk, meaning you've set up a risk calculation formula that's going to let them know this could damage patients, this could do this, could this could do that. It's letting them know right off the bat some of the, 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 the critical elements of this specific asset, okay? Saving time. I mentioned earlier the way that we do scheduling here, okay? So I'm gonna go into a scheduled event. There are no limits to the amount of PM levels that you can assign to assets within um, this, this, this application. As you can see, I've got three different scenarios. Obviously, anesthesia units, you're gonna have, a, have to maintain it all the time just because of the, because of the, the danger that it could oppose to patients. So it's gotta be checked quarterly, it's gotta be checked semi-annually, annually. I believe there's a three year and there's a five year also, but I didn't add those into here, okay? So you can, there's no limit to the amount of, of, uh, of, of PM levels, like I said, that you can add to this. Now, one of the cool things that I like the way that we do, the way that, why I like the way we do scheduling within um, AIMS 3, typically most CMMSs, you can only schedule preventive maintenance or plan event work orders to automatically be generated. Now, I know a lot of other ones may be out there doing it, but I'm just saying some of the ones that I've been exposed to, you actually, let's say for a battery replacement or something else like that, you actually have to bury that procedure into something that, into a preventive maintenance work order type. Well, within AIMS 3, I can actually create whatever work order type I want to, and I can schedule it to be run whenever I want to. I'm not relegated to just running automatically preventive maintenance or planned event work orders. So gone are the days where I have to bury my battery replacement into a procedure that's contained in a preventive maintenance work order. Now I, actually, I can actually create a battery replacement work order type, create the procedure for that. Again, everything that you do is gonna, be, is gonna reside in the data managers. So I can actually create a battery replacement procedure, assign it to a specific clinical engineer, assign, and I can, I can actually do multiple assigns. So I can assign multiple people to this, multiple people assigned to a work order, multiple people assigned to an asset, meaning uh, more accountability, okay? Give it a benchmark. So I can say, okay, this specific task should only take this amount of time. So if it's taking two hours to do a battery replacement, well, it's only estimated to be half an hour. I'm gonna be able to report on that and figure out why. These are all metrics, again, that are gonna help save time, okay? Give it a frequency, it could be a one-time event, it could be a monthly event, it could be a daily event within here. I mean, I, there's, all, there's no limit to the amount of scheduling I can do. I'm gonna decide what my next event date and time is gonna be. I can give it a grace period. I can give it a season beginning and ending. I can even do floating. It doesn't all have to be scheduled date. And I can label something, whether it's part of an AEM or an OEM. So when I want to report, so when Jayco says, okay, give me a list of all your AEM eligible assets, model, equipment type, whatever it is. If you have this marked on all your scheduling, you're going to be able to extract that data just like that. You're going to give it to them. And chances are they're going to look at it, say, great, and then they're going to move on to something else. As you know, those of you that have been through JCO inspections, if you give them a reason to look, they're going to look even more deep. Okay, so we really want everybody to be in compliance. And we're giving you all the the tools, all the little tidbits within this application to to keep everybody in compliance, so they can they can move on. Okay, now I can do that with a project as well. Let's say I've got a one-time project coming up, or opening up a, a new medical office building, or I've got new three new renovated ICU beds coming in where we're gonna to have to do incoming inspections, but I know it's not gonna happen until December, but I want four people assigned to it. I can actually create that work order type, create the procedure for it, assign those four technicians to that. How long should it take? Is it gonna take 
a week? Is it going to take 40 hours, 80 hours, whatever it is? Schedule it the one time. It'll generate in December when I run my PMs and it's off and running. And then I'll be able to account for all the hours the technicians are spending doing the incoming inspections for that specific project. Again, time savers, all time savers. Okay. Um, one other piece I want to talk about in regards to data managers, again, this is where all of your stuff resides. So all of your contracts, all of your codes, your, your, your cost centers, your employee, you know, all your employee records where I'm going to do my and assign my, my assignment profiles to my employees, all your status codes. If you're on a specific CMS and you decide you want to come to, to, over to Ames 3, we're going to convert the data as is, and we're going to find places for all your data and fields uh, within within the data managers. That's where the majority of the implementation is spent. Because if all of these uh, these data manager lists are correct, you're not going to have any problems when we do the, the final the final conversion. Okay. Another piece of this I want to point out in regards to procedures is doing interactive tasks. Okay. So I'm sure everybody's familiar with tasks, checklist tasks, and such. Well, I want to show you how easy it is to actually do it within Ames 3 again, saving time. I'm not a big proponent of putting everything in notes because there's honestly, there's no uh, accountability for your technicians to make sure that every step's been followed if, if it's in free text notes. That's just my personal opinion. I'm sure some of you have uh, other, very, uh, other opinions, but I like folks to be held accountable. I wanna make sure every field is populated and I wanna make sure that uh, when they close that work order, that preventive maintenance work order, every task, within that procedure was accounted for. So the way that you do that is you start building your master task list. And all I gotta do, if I'm doing a leakage current test, which I'm doing on a majority of my equipment when I do safety tests, all I gotta do is create that task one time. Create that task one time, get my full range of, of tasks in here. And these are all the different types of formats that I can do it in, whether I want a ranking or I want a value minimum maximum value. So if I'm doing a defibrillator and I'm checking that 100 joule output, I wanna give them a plus or minus 10% ranking. So if I'm looking for 100, uh, it better not go below 90 joules and it better not be over 110 joules. And I can actually put that right here and populate that specific value in here as well. I can do a free text, I can do a no response, I can do numeric. I can decide if something is going to, if you are allowed to close a work order with a failed step. And if that step fails, I can decide if I want a remedial work order automatically generated from the data manager's piece right here as well. So these are all things that I can do within these steps. And all I gotta do is build my master task list. Now, once I've got a bunch of tasks in here, I'm gonna come here to my procedures. And I'm gonna start building my procedures. And I'm gonna pull those procedures from whatever recommended procedure list that you, you, uh, you guys subscribe to, whatever it may be. We don't have procedures that we give to folks. We simply convert the ones that you have over because we're not going to tell people how to service their equipment at Phoenix. We're just not going to get into that game. And honestly, I don't know a lot of CMMS uh, companies that do that. So you're going to pull whatever, uh, whatever procedures and recommendations for the manufacturer that you have. You're going to give it its name. You're going to give it its benchmark. That's a key, key thing. Every manufacturer recommendation will have a estimated time when this PM should be complete. And you can add that into the procedure here, and it's going to be added onto the work order. So if you've got folks taking two and three hours to do something that should only take an hour, these are things that you can account for. Again, adjust fire so you can save time. You can assign this procedure to whoever, whatever team, whatever individual or multiple individuals you can do. And then this is where you start pulling those tasks from the master task list. Okay. So I'm going to start pulling from this list everything that's relevant to this specific procedure, okay? Then I'm gonna decide, okay, what is the format I want for this one? Because it doesn't matter what, uh, I can change my task to fit whatever format I want depending on the procedure. So if I want it to say pass fail in one procedure, it can. If I just want it to be no response in another one, I can do that as well. So there's a lot of different ways that you can create these tasks to be associated with procedures, okay? And again, this is all one-time stuff. I'm just showing you some one-time things as database administrators, as managers, so where you can set this up. So if you set it up one time, it's gonna be on autopilot moving forward. Again, saving you time, so you're not having to adjust things all the time um, 
to, 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 to account for this, account for that, or whatever it may be. And it's all reportable and it's all keeping you in compliance, the biggest part. Okay. So again, I created my procedure. Let's say I wanted to add that manual. Okay. It, it, I can add that documentation for that specific manufacturer's recommendations and I can add that PDF, that CAD drawing, whatever it may be, directly to the procedure. And in any procedure that this is a social, any, any asset, individual asset, model, equipment type that this procedure is associated with, guess what? That manual is going to automatically push globally to that specific task. Okay. So what does that look like? Once I've saved my procedure, I've uploaded that and I've assigned it to a model or equipment type or whatever it may be. I'm going to jump in back into this, um, this uh, anesthesia machine. I'm actually going to jump into a work order, a open preventive maintenance quarterly uh, maintenance work order. Okay. Once I do that, and that let's say this, uh, this PM was generated automatically when it's due. Here's the procedure right up here. I'm going to click on it. And my technicians, as you can see, these are all required fields. They have to go through each step, pass, fail. Did you check the hoses and tubing? Yes. Did you check the O2 sensor? Yes. Okay, tell me what the leakage test for that vaporizer was. What's the plus or minus? It needs to be within this range. Again, holding folks accountable and them having to actually go through to make sure you know that this procedure was done correctly. Once they go through this, a lot easier than having to go through in the notes and then pay, you know, copy paste where there's no accountability or anything like that. Now, those of you that do that, I'm not knocking it because you can still do that in this. You can cut paste, you can pull uh, you know, free text, whatever you need to do, you're going to be able to close the work order, but there's no accountability to that piece. So once that, that procedure is done, now you have the ability to come here, pull your PM result and close your work order directly from here. Okay. So there, these are just a few things that we have seen throughout the industry, talking to a lot of people, talking to identifying needs and either current clients, prospective clients, your folks that you know, I go to every Amy, I go to every MD Expo, just having discussions with people, some of their pain points. Every every department has pain points. And if you can save a minute here, 30 seconds there, if you can have your technicians, if, if your technicians jump into the database and they're not getting frustrated because they have to they have to run a asset list or they have to query their name and get a, a work order list automatic, uh, you know, saving time and keeping them less frustrated will keep them out of the database because they know that as soon as I log in, all my work orders are right here. All my queries are right here. And I know where I'm at as far as my PM completion percentages right here. I don't have to click on anything unless I want to open up a work order and bang out one of my PMs. So again, minutes here, seconds there. Over time, it saves money, it saves productivity. And again, it keeps your technicians from being less frustrated having to navigate through a CMS that they may not like, you know, it just I've seen it I've seen it over and over again so um give me one second so I mentioned uh earlier you know sorry about that so I want to just take in closing. If I have veterans on the call, uh, I want to express my deepest and sincerest appreciation for your service. Um, I wanted to just mention that ahead of time. I want to thank everybody for allowing me to speak to you and show you some of the keys to a to an application that I'm very, very proud of, and proud to represent, proud to show off. So, uh, Linda? Okay, Jeremy, thanks so much for that. We've got loads of questions so I'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, the first one is does AIMS 3 integrate with the ServiceNow platform? It absolutely does yes ma'am. So within our system setup we actually have interfaces built in. So I have several interfaces to some of these vendors that you may or may not recognize with the API key automatically assigned to that. So yes ServiceNow we can implement we are ready to demo it right now. I'm at currently implementing it in several different organizations as we speak. So it is individual. So every interface is different because every organization uses them different. So there's not one cut and paste for everybody. But uh, the way that we do interfaces is we do workflow uh, mapping uh, sessions to make sure that we're uh, 
whether you want one-way communication, bi-directional communication, which fields do you want populated? Uh, do you want fields populated in just aims? Do you want it populated in the service now? Uh, we kind of go through all of that doing the mapping, but yes, we interface with a lot of things and these are just some examples of some folks that we implement, that we integrate with, so. Great. Yeah. Okay, next question is, if I have several hundred assets that are the same model, is there a way in AIMS 3 for a user to upload one or, one or more attachments all at once without having to go to each individual asset record to do it? Absolutely, yes ma'am. So within our data managers, we have a section in here called vendor. So let's just go ahead and I'm gonna stay on the anesthesia machine thing. I'm gonna go to our draggers. So our dragger, this is our vendor record. Every model that's associated with Draeger is going to be listed here. So within each model, every model has a record associated with that. You've got all these different fields and tabs up here that you can actually set up a risk for all the models, set up scheduling one time, it'll be pushed out. So one of the things that we have here is also the ability for attachments. So what I can do is I can add an attachment or attachments, decide which is going to be my default image. So if I want a picture, if I want a manual, whatever it may be, I can upload it to the to their model record within the vendor data manager. Once I have it uploaded, I'm gonna click this button right here, which is my global push. So if I've got five assets or a thousand assets, it does not matter. If it's associated with this model, I can push those attachments out all at one time without having to go one by one. Again, saving time, a lot of time in this instance. So, yep. Okay. Another one here is, uh, is there a way for technicians to see their individual daily or weekly product productivity hours without ha having to run a report? Absolutely. So obviously you can run a report, but from the home screen, I mentioned a bunch of different widgets here that we have. So right, one of the ones that we have is daily. We have weekly productivity. So when I click on the daily, I'm going to add that to my front screen. I'm going to scroll down and you're going to see Today, all the technicians that I have within my database, this is going to show you the estimated hours. So these are those benchmark times that I was talking to you about earlier. Okay. So if I'm doing PMs, it's going to give me the number of PM hours, the number of total hours that I have, and this is the estimated hours for any PM. So obviously I've got uh, PM hours here, the estimated total hours that are associated with that, any kind of uh, non-PM, so these might be correctives, and it's going to give me a total of the work orders that were closed today. This is really good, uh, a good gauge for your techs to see where they are today as far as their eight-hour productivity days. It's also a gauge for you managers to jump in here and say, okay, what's Jeremy been doing today? Let me see where he's at. Um, so, yeah, and then again, you can export this data as well. Obviously, I can run a report within our reports tool. I can set up a dashboard to see that but it's nice to have this set up already. So I can save this widget directly to my home screen. So as soon as I log in, all of it's right there. So I'll know exactly where I'm at, weekly, daily, whatever you're looking for. So, yep. Okay, uh, another one here is, can you get the asset label printed from the application with bar QR code? Um, and also any preference on the printer make model that can effectively connect with the aims? That's a great question. I don't, we don't put right now, we don't print out specific labels. Now you have access, if you want to use your phone or your iPad to scan a barcode, it'll it'll automatically pop up that asset as long as that asset's in your database. But we don't print labels or anything like that. And I don't know if there's any specific printers that we subscribe to, but I know we don't print bar, we don't print out labels um, for assets. We, that's something that we don't do, but I can, um, if I get your contact information later, you you email me because my email address is right there. I can definitely give you some vendors uh, if you're looking for a, a good third party that might um, do well as far as creating uh, labels for you that you can print out yourself. Yeah. Sorry about that. We just don't do that currently. So. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, another one here. Does AIMS 3 have all of the functionality of the legacy AIMS.net Pro platform? Another great question. Yes, yes. Everything We didn't change a great, uh, a great uh, application. What we did was we're simply bringing it over, just enhancing it. So if you're a current AIMS.net user, fear not. Everything that you're used to using in .NET is going to be brought over to AIMS 3. It's just going to look a little differently, and it's going to be more high speed. 
That's the way we design. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel because Ames.net's a quality product. It just looks like it just it's just an older looking UI. We wanted to update the UI for the most part. So. Okay, so just leading on from that, so does the Ames three have the inspection worksheet capability of the legacy? Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It does. Yep. Okay. So let me find out where the inspection worksheet is. I know it's here somewhere. I know that they're here. Yeah, here's your inspection worksheets right there. Yep. Yep. So just going to look different. Okay, another question here is, will customers be able to see a listing of any known bugs in the software that are being addressed? Absolutely. I mentioned that earlier in the release notes. So when you do the release notes, when you pull them up, any bug fixes, as you can see right here, um, are going to be addressed in all the release notes. So it's going to look you. So here's an example right now. And what we plan on doing is we plan on eventually making these hyperlinks where you can click on it, it's going to take you and give you more detail into that specific bug. But right now, this is what you're going to be able to get. It's going to let you know what bug fixes are applied. There. Yes. Okay, another question from attendees says, um, I don't see Dispatch Center in the menu. Is it not yet in AIMS 3? Um, and if not, when will it be ready? Another great question. So I, this is a this is a uh, simply a, a, a demo site. Dispatch Center is actually being finalized and in testing right now. So uh, once it is, I'll be adding it to my demo site so that you can see it. We already have several key things that are part of it. So this, uh, so within the work order itself, you've already got a dispatch piece. It's automatic. It's going to be added to this, but I, I can't show it to you right now because it's in, test, in testing. But yes, Dispatch Center will be available here shortly. Uh, I will uh, send out a blast to everybody just to uh, let you know when it should be released to, to production. So. Great. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, can we view the results of a select a select SQL statement just like aims.net instead of exporting the results to Excel? Great question. I'm not sure if you can view it without exporting it to Excel. Let me get back to you on that one. Yes, if you can email me directly that, uh, again, my email address will be up here shortly, jfortune at goaims.com. Email me that question and I'll get you specifics on that. I do not know that for sure what that's going to look like. Okay. Um, another question here is, can procedures and tasks be associated with the manufacturer and model? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. You can associate it with a manufacturer, model, equipment type. Yes. Okay, all right. One more question. Uh, your build has a comment field listed in the task entry. Our build does not have this. When will this be released? Great question. Uh, the latest release should be pushed out here within the next week or so. Uh, if you can email me directly again, uh, whoever answer, asked this question, I can get you more specifics on that. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question, Jeremy. Is there a plugin for Team Play Fleet Connect? Is there a plugin for Team Play Fleet? Uh, F L R E E T. Yeah. If that's if they're asking for an integration, as long as that vendor allows us to integrate with it, our Open API should be able to plug in and, and, and integrate with it. Yes, um, that is another great question that I will have to get you answers on please email me directly with that so i can do a little research on that but another great question yeah okay well we're actually coming up to the end of our hour jeremy so what i'll do i will be sending you all the questions that we haven't had time to ask so Perfect. you can obviously reply directly to the attendees Perfect. so thank you so much jeremy your time today and for a great and informative presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor, Phoenix Data Systems, to learn more about the products they provide to our industry. So please visit goaims.com. As promised, the answer to today's trivia question is the Spartans. So congratulations to our winner, Stephanie Christensen. Um, a quick reminder, you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of this webinar. 
You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE credit from the ACI and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back next week with another webinar, so please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thanks again for your time today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next week.